uh, here in California, we probably have the longest history that we pay no attention to whatsoever with reference to these problems. And that's because the first big disaster was Santa Susana at the far end of the San Fernando Valley. And uh, if we learn from experience, we'll find out that the solution to that is, after you discuss these things, Boeing, by the way, was the major operator. I don't know who, who's related to the responsibilities now. Uh, they blocked an epidemiological survey of any kind. Uh, the uh, problems and the wastes and the poisons, and there's a lot of radioactive problems, are in groundwater there. And they solved the problem, and the only way we can really solve problems in California, and that's they paved it over and they have housing there now. <laughs> and it seems to me that we could learn a little better than that, but are we learning anything from experience? Here in California, we've had a longer run of this thing, and people just don't want to think about it. And I'm sure that there are a large proportion of the people that are around us and all the communities that just don't want to think about it. But somebody's got to think about it because it's really significant. So my question is, how do we get past I mean, you're trying to get the message out. You're trying to get facts before people. You're answering questions. What do we do? Any hints for us? I think that's an excellent question. You have to get involved uh, in these proceedings. You have to get involved before the PUC, you know, on the, on the money that they want to spend. You have to get involved at the NRC, uh, in the sa and that gets into the minutia of uh, safety questions. Uh, I don't know how else to say it, except you have to uh, continue to question authority. He's president of, e, of IEER, the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. His PhD is from uh, UC Berkeley in fusion. That's what we're talking about. And has many studies and articles relating to weapons production testing, waste and over the past he's been writing for over the past 20 years and a very interesting topic that he has authored is carbon free and nuclear free a, a roadmap for US energy policy seems like that's that's uh, really all we're really looking at most of the time in our internal world and our, our geopolitical world. Uh, he's the principal editor of Nuclear Wastelands and principal author of Mending the Ozone Hole, both published by MIT Press. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Maka Jani. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I wound up in Berkeley a long time ago by a circuitous route. I graduated in Bombay, actually, from the university there, and I thought it'd be nice to go to school in the capital of the country, the United States. And so I applied to Washington State University. <laughs> and they gave me this, you're not the only geographically challenged person. <laughs> so, uh, and they gave me this assistantship, and I went. And I did my master's there, but I did do my doctorate at Berkeley. I, I love living in California. My, my daughter lives here, and so I come to California often still, and it's wonderful to be back. And um, in the top left, you see the pellets. They're pretty small, each pellet. And in the middle, you see what a fuel tube looks like, a fuel rod. And um, there's a fuel assembly there uh, at the top uh, right. And in the bottom left, you see when the fuel pellets are ready, these are, of course, all pre before irradiation. And then they put them into the fuel rods and uh, put the assembly together, and they have spacers and holders and so on. And so that's, that's what it looks like before it goes into the reactor. Of course, that you, you know that. Oh, I'm going backwards. OK, that's the spent fuel pool. So I just want to tell you a little bit of what's inside those fuel rods. So fresh fuel is basically. Uranium-235, which is what fissions, 
and produces the energy. And that's about 4%. And in a high burnout fuel, it might be more. In the old days, for low burnout fuel, it used to be more like 3.3%. So this is a typical case rather than every fuel assembly. Uh, mostly it's uranium-238, which is not fissile. And then it has no fission products and waste and so on. This is natural uranium. And then once you use it up, I think this, although the slide doesn't say it, from memory, this may be 40,000 megawatt days. So it's on the mark, it's approaching high burn up, but not quite high burn up. So when you see you've consumed most of the uranium-235, it's produced the energy. Some of the uranium-238 has become plutonium. Some of the plutonium has been consumed to produce energy. Uh, but there's still about 1% left. Uh, you get a new isotope of uranium from transportation, about half a percent of that. Uh, it makes the used up uranium kind of not very usable again. Uh, although it has been done, it's not very effective. And the fission products, which is the waste, the highly radioactive part of it is that 4.262% almost all the radioactivity comes from that. And then there are some other heavy radionuclides, neptunium, uh, for example. All right, so I, I haven't been able to find exact consistent numbers. Uh, some of these data are from Sandia. You, you, you don't want to be packing these things into canisters. On the contrary. Okay, so don't read all of the fine print in this. I just wanted to say the, there is a cesium isotope, cesium-134, which has a half-life of about two years. People near Fukushima know about it. They always talk about the two isotopes. Um, there's quite a lot of that when you first pull it out, more of that in terms of radioactivity than cesium-137. But it decays away, and then after 10 or 15 years, you, you have very little left. And after five or six years, really, mostly you worry about, about cesium 137. But, but there is that other isotope, so if you have an accident or some event that releases radioactivity in the short term, uh, you have those two isotopes to worry about, that one and that one. Uh, so the, I did some very rough numbers based on a science and global security article by Alvarez and a number of others including uh, the current chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Alison McFarland, is one of the authors of that, so it would be worthwhile for you to read it. And there's some calculations in there. I, I didn't have permissions for the, for the figures, so I, I, didn't, I didn't use them in the slides, and I hope eventually get permission to add them to these slides, and then Donna can put them on our website, and thank you, Donna, for showing me your website. I learned a lot already. So I, I don't here just come here to say things that might help you. I also always learn a lot because activists are always most concerned about their sites, and they know a lot of things that I don't know. So I already learned a few things. So I really appreciate that. So at Chernobyl, the, the radiation control amount, how much cesium deposited in the soil on land, was sort of a strictly controlled area. And that number was this, this 15, do I have that 15, 15, 15 curies per square kilometer. Now this is a horrible, horrible way to do things because this is not metric units and this is metric units. But this is America so we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, normally you count radiation in, in Becquerel's. So 30, a curie is 37 billion becquerels. Becquerel is a disintegration per second. It's a more easy thing to think about. So you know how much it is. So if, if, you, if something happened in the short term and 10% of the cesium were released into the air, say through a spent fuel pool fire, given the amount of uh, number of assemblies there are in the pools, in, in just one of the pools, you could have a spread of contamination of thousands of square miles. The radio, if, if it is a steady wind in one direction, you, you get these cigar-shaped fallout. You might have seen fallout from, from uh, nuclear tests. 
Uh, if you look at the fallout pattern from the high-level waste explosion in the Soviet Union in 1957, you see a long trace like that, cigar-shaped trace. And it could, it could go for hundreds of miles, so that would answer Suresh uh, Makijani's question that uh, you, you would need something faster than running or a car in California traffic. Um, so, but you do have to worry about strontium 90. Strontium 90 doesn't get into the plume because it, it doesn't evaporate at, at the kind of fire temperatures we're talking about. Uh, so it stays in the pellet, but what is happening at Fukushima now is um, that it is being contacted by rain and water and storms and typhoons and so on. And also groundwater is contacting the molten fuel. And so it, it uh, is mobilizing the strontium-90. So st cesium, once it falls on the soil, doesn't migrate very easily into the groundwater. That's how the properties of cesium. Strontium-90 is much more mobile in water, so it's mobilized much more, and then it will get into the groundwater faster. It will, and it's also like calcium, so it gets to your bones. And per unit of radioactivity, strontium-90 is much more dangerous than cesium because it targets certain organs. It goes to the bone. Cesium is cesium like potassium, so it goes all over the body. So strontium-90, normally we don't worry about, we don't see calculations of it, but after Fukushima, I think we should be much more conscious, especially in a place like this. Okay, so here I'm going to try to give you my best idea of, so you're already moving, uh, did I skip some slides? No, I didn't. I might have deleted some slides, okay. So emptying the spent fuel pools is a good idea, generally. The putting it in dry casks is a good idea, generally. I am not sure that we have done an adequate, in relation to the answer of the uh, person who asked an earlier question, an adequate, thorough study of the comparative robustness of the casks for the kind of duration of storage that we're talking about. The initial casts that were used in the United States and Virginia were German cast caster five casts. They are still used in Germany. I, they have a triple lid. Um, I, Marvin, do these have a double lid? Where is Marvin? He knows more about the cast construction than I do. Left side. You asked whether it has They have a double lid. The yes. castor casts have a triple lid. Um, they, I, I think for the high burn up spent fuel, first let me tell you what we know about spent fuel in storage, in dry storage. So generally, pool storage is worse than dry storage because there's a lot of fuel in the pool. And if it catches fire, then a lot of radioactivity is at, in play. Uh, it, the, the same intensity of fire as a result of some attack on a cask, or, you're, you're only talking about one and a half percent of the radioactivity. So you're talking, you're talking reducing the damage from a severe inc incident by not quite a hundred times, but a lot. So that's the reason all of us who are in the business say do dry casks. But that's not the end of the story. The, I think we ought to do a more thorough comparison of dry casks, given that these things are going to be sitting around for a very long time. You don't want to be changing casks. So that's item one. Somebody asked a question about that. So I'm going to try to pick up some of these answers. There was a petition uh, from Minnesotans that I mentioned during the press conference. I'll tell you a little bit more about it now. Uh, in several years ago, I think about 10 or 12 years ago, where the people near Prairie Island, in, which is a pair of nuclear power plants sim similarly situated with different kind of problems, the middle of the Mississippi River on an island. Uh, and they said that if there's a damaged fuel assembly, uh, the NRC doesn't really know how to transfer it from one cask to another. 
And the NRC replied, so this was a formal petition to the NRC to see what they would do and how they would manage such a situation. I have the documents with me, not, not with me right now, but I have them in, in my files. And the NRC says, it's true that we wouldn't know what to do, and we haven't worked it all out yet. There's never been a transfer from a dry cast to another dry cast. So, but we would know the fuel is damaged. We would, and we would know that we have a problem. So we would quickly, quickly put it back. They didn't say it exactly in that way. The, and then we would figure it out, figure out what to do. That was the official response. I have brought this up with one of the commissioners in a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting. I have brought this up in public. I'm going to bring it up again in writing. I'm, I'm, I'm doing some work for all the people who are involved in this so-called waste confidence. Now let me tell you what is in the draft waste confidence environmental impact statement where the court ordered the NRC to say what it would do if we don't have a repository, because obviously the NRC's pronouncements that we will have a repository when we need it <laughs> are, are, are a political judgment for which the court said the NRC was not particularly due any special deference. The NRC is due deference on technical questions. And uh, so the court ordered the NRC to look at the impacts of indefinite storage. And in the draft environmental impact statement, for which you're going to have a hearing here, and I'm giving you a tip on what you might say, and uh, you'll see more on your email, some those of you who are active from me, or, or from the lawyers who are coordinating this, is they have said that indefinite storage um, would essentially have very low impact because, and this is a multi-layered answer, because the spent fuel would not degrade significantly. Uh, we, we assume that the canisters would degrade, or the, these dry cast storage would degrade uh, in 100 years, so this concrete would be kind of no longer a very good structure. And we would have the facilities on site to transfer the spent fuel from one structure to another structure. And we would do this every 100 years. And we would do this indefinitely, 500 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. At first I thought they were talking about 10,000 years, which seemed like quite a long time to me. But in answer, answer to a question from me, uh, the NRC has said that, no, this is actually indefinite, essentially. So we're talking like hundreds of thousands of years. And that the federal government would appropriate money for all these activities every 100 years. And that, we sh that assuming that the federal government is going to be around for that long is much more sensible than assuming that it won't be around to appropriate money. And then the, the real kind of, I don't know how you top that, but they did. <laughs> the, because after 300 years or 400 years, the cesium basically is gone. So it's no longer deadly to approach this waste. Because, as I said, it's no longer a problem for evil Knievel or even if you're much slower. So you can approach it and it won't kill you. And that is a problem because this stuff has got all that plutonium in it. Remember, every reactor makes 30 bombs worth of plutonium every year. So you had about 30 years of operation of two reactors. Forget the small one. So about 60 reactor years times 30, you got 1,500, 2,000 bombs worth of plutonium in them dark casks and pools. So you don't want these things to be stolen. So if Congress isn't appropriating money for those security guards hundreds of years from now, and uh, all that it takes is a very large truck or train or whatever, then, or even disassembling some of this stuff and carrying away parts of it, all possible, then you've got a much different problem than what we've been talking about. Totally different, qualitatively different. It's a proliferation problem. It's a nuclear bomb type of problem. Not here, but somewhere, wherever it might be made. It's not specific to San Onofre. But so obviously it would require more money to guard this, because now you've got a theft problem. This is theft proof, basically. You can't steal this stuff and take the plutonium out. You need a reprocessing plan. It's messy, difficult, costly, and detectable. 
But afterwards, it's not so messy, not so costly, and not so detectable. And so you have to appropriate more money to guard this stuff. And the NRC thinks that hundreds of years from now, the US government will do it. Because it, it, is, it is obliged to protect the public, which it may be. But I am going to say in my comments, and I hope that you will do too, that we can see what is happening right now in terms of the current obligations of the US government. And that's a question. So it's good to have this low density open frame. Open frame means you don't have barriers between the spent fuel in the pool, spent fuel assembly in the pool. So that's what that is. We need to work on a repository. You won't be out of this problem unless those of us who don't like nuclear power understand there isn't a technical solution down the pike. I looked for 10 years. I honestly did. I thought it was all a ruse that they, would, they were hiding high costs of disposal. And that was my a starting assumption as a cynic. Uh, but at the end of 10 years, having done, you know, looked at phototransmutation, accelerator driven transmutation, this, that, transmutation, all transmutation, I concluded that any solution would be much, much, much worse than. So the worst case of what could happen in a repository is orders of magnitude and qualitatively different than the worst case of what could happen on surface storage. And I think those of you who live near it know it better than. Now, this doesn't mean a repository is a good answer. It just means it's good to stop, see the end of the production of spent fuel. So we need to do that. That's why I wrote Carbon Free, Nuclear Free. And I think we can do that without busting our pocketbooks. Uh, and in California, you are leaders, so you should be proud. Uh, as close to the site as possible. So you haven't, we haven't discussed whether this could be taken to a less sensitive area. Obviously a very sensitive area for lots and lots of reasons. And you know this better than me, so I won't talk about it. Um, moving spent fuel to centralized storage is not a good idea. That's the Blue Ribbon Commission said. So it increases risks in a number of ways. I'm not for transportation that we don't absolutely need. OK. So I, I'll say one thing about this high burnout fuel is we, what we know about spent fuel and dry storage is from examination of a single low burnout spent fuel assembly that had been in dry storage for 10 years or 15 years. There's a report about it, was physically examined. Um, and, but we don't know anything about, high burnout was authorized without knowing anything about the back end of what happens. So I'm not entirely sure what happens when you put this stuff and the temperature inside the dry cask get hot because it's harder to cool it. I'm not sure that you need to store it as long as 20 years, but I'm not sure it's good to take it out of the pools, especially the highest burnout fuel. I, I don't have an answer to it. And to the extent that I know, I don't think anybody can tell you because we don't have the physical evidence. I can show you something. So here we have some, this is what happens in a reactor. So when you increase the burn up, this, this side is how many oxides, so it's metal rods, right? So the ox, oh, sorry. So the oxides build up, and you can see this is, this is about 60,000. So you can, the, 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 the space between, oh God, the, sp <laughs> the space between the red lines is the uncertainty and the, the top red line is sort of the maximum damage or oxide accumulation you see. And on the right chart, you see the same for how much hydrogen is seeping, weakening the fuel rod structure. So when you have these two kinds of weakening, of course, when you have gas buildup and heat buildup, it's much more susceptible to break apart. 
So high burn-up fuel, more susceptible to damage, more susceptible to undergoing high temperatures. NRC does not have the data. Uh, and so I have talked about, there are already 95 failed fuel assemblies in dry storage in San Onofre from data from an NRC inspection report of 2011. I don't know if any of these are high burn-up damage spent fuel assemblies. So I don't have the answer, but we really need to push the NRC to do the research on high burn-up spent fuel examine it much more closely while it's in the pools because it's not immune from damage in the pools. And so this is, you've seen this already, so I'll skip it. Uh, so I talked about comparison with German casks. Um, so we haven't talked about hardening the structure. So there are, unfortunately this is all Fortunately, unfortunately, this is already being done without consideration of the best kind of storage. So I answer to that earlier question. The best kind of storage would have the best casks, and I'm not for long-term storage, so you don't have to change them very often, or at all, preferably. It would have a low visual signature, which is not true of these casks. It would have maybe berms protecting it or other kind of physical protection. In Germany, sometimes they store these casks in buildings. That may still be possible here. I don't know. Then you have to. Here, of course, you still, we don't have a good seismic evaluation of the San Onofre site. Still, new things are being discovered. The current chairman of the NRC is on record as saying that the paradigms for seismology change have been changing every 30, 40. The paradigms, not new minor things in science. It's like, you know, tectonic plates. We don't know about that 50 years or 60 years ago. So I think what kind of structure you build to hold these things is a very important thing. Not just saying it's good enough corresponding to the seismic risks that we know plus some margin of error. It, I don't believe that is good enough. And you might pose a question to the chairman of the NRC about her statements are quite public. And um, uh, they were published in an article just before she became chairman. And I don't have an answer to you for high burn-up spent fuel right now. So costs, this is from a paper done by Bob Alvarez. Uh, he quoted EPRI as saying 122 million. I didn't have time to go to the original EPRI publication myself. Hardened on-site storage as estimated in 2003 uh, may cost double that. By my estimate, if the gov federal government doesn't pay any of it, uh, it will cost about $2 per year per household for 10 years. And of course, other ratepayers, commercial ratepayers also have to pay correspondingly. It, it's a fraction of a cent per kilowatt hour. The current rates, I think, for residential something like 15 cents per kilowatt hour, if I'm not mistaken. Give me a little elbow room, because I don't live here. OK. So you need storage for decades. Summary. Whether you're looking for some off-site location because of the seismic thing, or you decide to do hardened, this is, these are questions that you really should open up and open up urgently because dry casks are being built and fuel is being put in them. That's not a bad thing. You don't want to stop that, but you do want to open these questions up urgently so you can get the best possible before you get to putting a lot of that high burn up fuel in dry storage. Um, so here's my long-term thing. So we have. I've said that you should have a repository. Blue Ribbon Commission has said that. Blue Ribbon Commission has said there should be a consent-based process. In my mind, it has to be an informed consent-based process. Unfortunately, not a qualification that the Blue Ribbon Commission. And initially, they had said more about a science-based and consent-based process. But in the final report, that first part, didn't entirely disappear, but more or less went away. Now, if you have consent without science, it's not informed. 
and it's going it's an invitation for environmental injustice it won't be in coastal california you know that and not because coastal california is more or less vulnerable because coastal california is wealthier than other parts of yeah. the country I, I this will amuse you in 1983 the national academy a national academy panel on geologic isolation wrote a report on on possible sites and consequences and dose assessments and so on. It was a very good report um, on geologic isolation. And they had a little figure in there, which it seems only I have interpreted, um, about a certain kind of geology with sedimentary rocks under which there was a granite with uh, brackish water that people wouldn't want to drink because obviously we have quite a lot of fresh water in the west, in the east, fortunately. and um, and they had this little diagram about where it might be. And it turns out that it is an activist dream answer because it's not very far from the White House. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm saying that even though I live not far from the White House. But in the interest of science, you will know that there is one person who did tell you, <laughs> even though it's against its own interest. But I'm moving to California. The, um, all right, so I have said, and so Yucca Mountain was a very bad site, and I won't tell you why, you can ask me. So I wasn't against Yucca Mountain because it was a geologic repository. I was against Yucca Mountain because we're, if we're going to put it somewhere, we need to make sure that we are being just as good as we can to the communities near there or that may be near there in the future. There was nobody in Las Vegas 500 years ago. Okay, so it's not just putting it underground. It's the canisters, it's the, ge it's the engineering around it, it's, it's the geologic system, and remember, it's not just the geology. The geology can be great, but now you're making a huge mine in it, and you've got to fill it back up. You've got all these new joints, you've got all these new surfaces, you've got all these materials that have to not react and be married with each other. Your initial groundwater chemistry is no longer going to be the same. So you have reducing chemistry, but now then you've got water from the surface, it's got a lot of oxygen in it. How long will it take to reestablish the original chemistry? Will it ever be reestablished? These are extremely difficult. That's why geologic repository is the least bad answer. It's not something we can say, yeah, well, you know, I did this and I can. If it were just geology, we could talk about millions of years. But it's not just geology. It's much, much harder. So I have suggested, let's do our homework for about 10 years. Let's see what, how these three elements work together before we go telling people you, you, and you, and not you, you, and you. That's, that didn't work before because you can't really do good science. You cannot propose repositories to people based on sound science and what we know in this country. And we know what has failed. So I proposed it to the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, and of course, you didn't find my recommendation in the final report. But maybe we will take it up so that we can have a sensible program because I know that what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has proposed, that we can just, if we don't have a repository, don't worry. The federal government will be there to appropriate the money every 100 years, and we'll have all the guns and guards that we need. And it'll all go, and we'll increase the, even though there are no revenues. So, you want an immigrant's final answer as to how the government works, you can ask me in the question. Thank you for your talk. And I'm curious, you mentioned strontium is very, very um, uh, mobile, if you will. More mobile than cesium. Right. Um, if it's coming across, suppose the worst things happen at Fukushima, comes across the Pacific, ends up at the shore. Was, is that likely to be coming up in rainwater and clouds and going inland and being brought forth? No, it will not come in rainwater because, as I said, it, you know, it, we're not talking about single atoms. We're talking about um, significant amounts. Um, by significant amounts, you know, we have a lot of fallout from nuclear testing. So that's kind of a benchmark. Um, so you know if it's comparable to or greater than nuclear testing fallout, you're talking about a substantial amount. 
the strontium-90 is winding up in the water through leaching and flowing through the soil. It's not going to come down in rainfall, um, unlike cesium and iodine. And, and the dilution factor across the Pacific Ocean is very large. And so even the cesium, we talked, um, Dr. Moser talked about the, the tuna earlier. So tuna will take in cesium, of course, like potassium, but we're also excreting it. So there's a kind of a biological half-life for cesium that's much shorter than the radioactive half-life, which is 30 years. So we don't retain it for 30 years. So sometimes the biological half-life can be longer than your life, in which case you take it in and it's there and, and you go to the grave with it. But that's not the case with cesium. So the tuna that go across actually have been measured to have much less radioactivity at this side of the ocean than at that side of the ocean. And um, I think the radioactivity problems from Fu Fukushima currently are mainly for the Japanese people. And you have to not eat food from around the coastal area there, which is already banned. Uh, but the source from the amount of cesium and strontium in Fukushima in the molten fuel and spent fuel pools is very huge. Fortunately, only we're talking about leakage that involves only very tiny fractions of it. But if that changed, of course. I have a question about tsunami hazard. About 200 years ago, there was an earthquake that uh, toppled the, uh, San, uh, the uh, San Juan Capistrano mission. And the friars recorded that they had a 35 to 50 foot tidal wave that followed within a few minutes. And maybe I have a, a hyperactive imagination, but I can imagine where a tsunami hits a pool and knocks everything into the corner and, and the water leaks out. Is there really a hazard with a, a tsunami? I, 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 have not, I have not studied tsunami risks in this area. I, I have studied to some extent the seismic the state of seismic knowledge here, just from the point of view of trying to estimate what it might cost to keep San Onofre running if if it were required to make those upgrades. So so I have looked at those kinds of questions, but I certainly am not, uh, am not um, a student of the seismic records and the tsunami records, so I think you know more about it than me. If it is correct, then it is to worry about, and it and the structures that have been built um, should be able to withstand it. You know, the dry storage at, at Fukushima did withstand the tsunami. Well, the, that's, a, that's a hopeful thing. San Onofre was designed on the basis of seismic knowledge at that time. Since then, we discovered that we had right. a lot of hidden faults and so forth. Right. But when you're looking backwards at historic data, that's something that uh, is not, all, not just theoretical. Right, no, no, I agree with you. So that's why I said that Presuming that what you said is correct, or what the friars wrote is correct, uh, <coughs> I think there's something that should be evaluated. It's just I'm not competent to do it. Um, how does the hot fuel at San Onofre compare with the hot fuel that they had, the extra hot fuel over at uh, Fukushima? I don't think I've looked at the burn-ups at Fukushima, actually. Um, but the fact is that at Fukushima, the pool, pools are not dense packed because um, they have that you know, common spent fuel pool where the old fuel was evacuated, they had dry casks. And um, only one of the pools had a significant, a large amount of, what we would call a large amount of spent fuel in it, uh, which was reactor number four, which had the whole reactor core unloaded into the pool because of maintenance and the reactor was shut down for maintenance. So. Uh, that's the only pool to really worry about. When we talk about spent fuel problem, pool problems in Fukushima, uh, almost all attention is focused on that one reactor, which has much less spent fuel than. Vermont Yankee has more spent fuel in its pool than all of the four Fukushima reactors put together. Uh, my question is about reactor four in Fukushima. Okay. <laughs> okay. I asked for that, I guess. <laughs> Okay, now the TEPCO is ready to take out about 1,500 spent fuel rods from the uh, spent fuel uh, pool sitting on the fourth floor. And uh, this is extremely dangerous operation. And uh, failure of this operation can put um, whole entire northern hemisphere for the high risk of radiation. Now, TEPCO is claiming they're going to start this operation from this coming November. 
which is a couple weeks away, and they are going to do this within a year. Now, is this, how realistic is this, and can they really do it? You know, I, I have not studied technical, te TEPCO's technical plans in detail, but we all know something about TEPCO and its statements, uh, that they should not be taken at face value. The, and this is un, a most unfortunate thing, but this, this is way before Fukushima, as you know. Um, they, they, they have a record of mm, that if you are not skeptical of what they say, you know, uh, something is not quite right with you. And so, and so you should be skeptical. That said, un, there are many opinions on spent fuel pool four. Mine is not fully informed. It's informed as well as I can, not working on it full time. I, I work on it from time to time when people say, tell me something, and so then I study it for two days, and then I say something. Uh, but I have looked at this recently a fair amount because of all the leaks and you know all the problems. I, I think it's very important to empty spent fuel pool number four. It's got very hot fuel in it because the reactor core was emptied into it. If there's a, another earthquake or another tsunami, uh, it's a damaged structure, uh, it's very vulnerable. So there's no kind of catastrophe free scenario for spent fuel pool four. We should. So we are asking the same question that I've been addressing in this talk. Is in the worst case scenario, which is the least bad? So I think that because the worst case scenarios are truly intolerable. And so I think getting emptying or nearly emptying or thinning out spent fuel pool four is very important. Whether it should go into dry casts or the common spent fuel pool, or be, that I'm not so sure. So I think TEPCO is right in principle that this is a good thing to do. I know they've built the structures and the cranes and so on and so on. I do think it's very necessary for some independent, uh, technically competent team to look over TEPCO's plans before they start pulling that fuel out to make sure that they have considered all the risks properly and that the scenarios for failure are not catastrophic failure. Okay, so they're saying we can do this, it won't be catastrophic and so on. I think some independent technical evaluation needs to be done. Um, I know you have a new nuclear regulatory authority in Japan but I'm not entirely sanguine that they have their eyes on the right thing. I think now they're paying more attention to Fukushima because of all the scandals around the leaks. From the number of hearings that they had held on Fukushima compared to restarting, restarting the shutdown power plants uh, before the leak scandal, before July, I would say they were more concerned about restarting the nuclear power plants before the leaks than they were just, just simply from how, how, how much they were talking to the public about one thing compared to the other thing. Maybe unfair, but I, uh, you know. Uh, I think attention of the nuclear regulatory authorities should be focused on Fukushima. It's a giant, giant issue. It's a bleeding accident that has not stopped more than two and a half years. Its downside is very, very grave. We're not fortunately there, as I indicated earlier. We're dealing with a small fraction of the radioactivity at the site in terms of leaks and tanks and so on, which is bad enough. So I think they, my best judgment, admittedly not come without any guarantee. Uh, normally I guarantee, my, guarantee you my best judgment, but I cannot in this case. So I recommend that some independent, competent authority should make a public evaluation and publish the report, and they should find a way to go ahead as prudently and expeditiously as possible. That's the best answer I can give you. Thank you for answering these questions that are so difficult, and many of them don't have answers. So um, I think in follow-up, kind of in the same line of thinking that you just concluded, that we need independent experts to deal with these situations honestly, openly, transparently, and as soon as possible. Yeah. 
And hearing all of the uncertainty in the questions today is understandable, but it gives me this feeling of urgency, like we have to do this quickly, because when you start to look at the timeline, and I don't understand it all, but I wish I could get a better picture of it. Uh, Ace Hoffman made a nice animation, maybe we'll see it pretty soon, but it shows you how the dangerous years are really right now. now. Yes, and totally. It's probably true. safe to, I mean, it's maybe a 15 to 20 year window, and at the same time we have experts that are retiring and may not be around in 15 or 20 years, and we have new students that are learning about how do we make more nuclear power plants instead of how do we deal with the waste. And we have very little time to solve this problem before all of this waste is in dry cast storage starting to fail around the globe. And I don't think I get the sense of urgency from the NRC or from our government or anything unless we the people start shouting about it. Yeah, well, well, and I'd like I, 